This presentation is on the topic of solutions. Our learning targets for today include being able to distinguish between a pure substance, a solution, a suspension, and a colloid. You'll be able to describe how polarity, temperature, and pressure impact solubility. You'll also be able to explain the rate of salvation and what can affect it and how it can change. You'll be able to apply the terms saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated to solutions, and you'll also be able to interpret a solubility curve. Let's start by asking ourselves the question, what is a solution? So a solution is also commonly referred to as a homogeneous or homogeneous mixture, and it consists of two parts. The first part being a solute. The solute is the substance being dissolved and it's often present in the smaller quantity. So here we have a, an example of a solute in powder form. So you could say this is cobalt 2 chloride in powder form. We're gonna take the solute and we're gonna immerse it in the second part of the solution called solvent. The solvent is usually the, um, the substance present in the greater quantity and it's going to be doing the dissolving. So our solvent's gonna be water and the water is going to be in this volumetric 250 milliliter flask. And the way to make this solution is we're going to insert the solid into the volumetric flask we would use ideally a funnel or something so that um, it wouldn't spill outside of the container. And then we would add the water to fill up to the calibration line to make sure we reach the 250 milliliter mark. Once those two are mixed, we would end up with this red colored uniform solution where it looks the same throughout the top and the bottom. So this is just a simple example of what a solution um, and how to make a solution in the lab would look like. So some vocabulary to keep in mind as we go through our lesson today, uh, we're gonna go over the terms pure substance, solution, suspension, and colloid, and make sure we know how to distinguish them. So we'll start by looking at a pure substance. So pure substance is matter composed of only one kind of atom or molecule. So in this case, we're gonna look at this pink and white, these overlapping circles. Notice how the picture is the same and it's repeated multiple times. So an example of a pure substance could be an ionic compound like a salt. If this were a salt, we would call this a formula unit instead of a molecule. The next picture we'll look at is a solution. So a solution, you know, has two parts, solute and solvent. So we'll say the yellow dots here represent the particles of the solvent. And we're putting the solute or the salt into the solvent. And notice how the solute and the solvent are mixed evenly throughout the picture here. They're dispersed evenly. So you can tell that this is a uniform homogeneous mixture. The next term we'll look at is suspension. So a suspension is also a type of mixture, but a suspension is not a solution. It's actually a heterogeneous mixture that looks like a homogeneous mixture. And when I say that, I mean it appears uniform. So initially, while it's being stirred, while it's being mixed or agitated, it'll all look like it's uniformly mixed throughout, but given some time, um, left to settle for a while, you'll notice that the particles in the suspension are quite large. They're usually visible to the eye or they can be visible to the eye and they're, um, the size is a thousand nanometers or greater. And what'll happen is over time, those particles will settle to the bottom. They're heavier, they're larger due to their size compared to the molecules making up the solvent, they will uh, separate. So an example that you can think of for a suspension could be paint or chocolate milk or hot cocoa. So all of those items require some amount of stirring so that the um, experience of them is uniform. A can of paint often has instructions to stir the mixture before applying it to a wall just so that the color appears even on your wall. 
uh, chocolate milk or hot cocoa. If you let it cool or let it sit over time, you'll, you might notice that the uh, cocoa powder will sink to the bottom because the particles are larger or more dense. Now, looking at a colloid, a colloid is actually an intermediate between heterogeneous mixtures and solutions. So the molecule size of the solute in a colloid is going to be smaller than that of a suspension, but larger than that of a um, of particles in a solution. So the range would be somewhere between five and 1,000 nanometers. So they're small enough to remain suspended in the solvent. So here we have pictures of um, milk, dairy milk under a microscope, and you can see the fat globules that are in the milk, um, the liquid fat globules in the liquid solvent here, they are suspended in that, in that same phase as the solvent. So we can call this a colloid because if you consider milk that you would buy from the grocery store, if you were to buy a carton, if you were to buy a carton of milk, usually all you have to do is open the carton and drink it. There's no need to stir or mix the contents because it's going to be evenly distributed throughout. Okay, so a milk is classified as one type of colloid known as an emulsion. Let's take a look at a couple more examples of colloids. So for colloids, remember the particles, they don't settle when the stirring stops. They remain suspended in the solution. Uh, there are different types of colloids though, though besides uh, emulsions. So smoke is a type of colloid and it's classified as an aerosol. So that, that, that's when you have solid particles suspended in, uh, suspended in gas. And fog is another type of aerosol where you have liquid suspended in a gas. One distinguishing characteristic of colloids is that they exhibit what's called the Tyndall effect. And that is a scattering of light by colloid particles causing the light beam to become visible. So this picture here with the flashlight shining its beam of light through the three beakers lined up in a row is an example of what it means to scatter the light. So you'll notice that when the beam is aimed through the beaker that has a solution in it, it shines straight through. There is no interference by the particles in the solution. They're too small to cause any scattering of light. So there is no beam visible. There is no light visible within the container. But if you go over to the colloid beaker, you'll notice that there is a beam of light there. And that's because the particles are large enough to cause that scattering of the light. And then the same thing will happen in the suspension before the particles settle to the bottom. They will cause interference of the light and scatter it. So let's go over a few more examples of types of solutions. Solutions don't have to have a solid solute and a liquid solvent. You can have other phases of matter involved. So let's look at a, an example of a solution involving a gas solute and a gas solvent. So we'll start with nitrogen and carbon dioxide. Both are gases and both can be mixed together in a homogeneous mixture or uniform solution. Another example of a solution is sparkling water. Sparkling water has carbon dioxide as its solute dissolved in water as the solvent. Another example of a mixture. Liquid and liquid mixture. So vinegar, household vinegar, um, is actually acetic acid watered down. So when acetic acid is diluted or added to water, um, the concentration of it will drop and we to a safe level which can be consumed. So that is vinegar. Another example of a solution is liquid and solid. So dental fillings, old dental fillings containing mercury, uh, mercury would be the solute here, that is added to an alloy of silver, tin, and copper. So all together these elements mixed make up the dental fillings. And remember, mercury is at, at room temperature is liquid, so that's why it's classified as the liquid solute here.
solid and liquid uh, would just be, you could say salt water, ocean water, uh, sodium chloride in water would be considered salt water. And remember with mixtures, whether they're solutions, homogeneous mixtures or heterogeneous mixtures, the ratios don't matter. You can have uh, one teaspoon of salt immersed in or dissolved in a cup of water and call it salt water. You can have a teaspoon of salt in a gallon of water or a liter of water and call it salt water. The amounts don't matter as long as um, the solute and solvent are both present. You can call it a mixture. And you can distinguish that from a pure substance, for example, with water. Water can only be H2O. You must have two hydrogens for every oxygen. You can't have H5O, for example, and call it water. So the proportions in a pure substance don't change, but they can change for a mixture. Okay, solid in solid. So alloys, I mentioned that term earlier when we talked about fillings. So an alloy is a homogeneous mixture of um, metals or metals and other elements. So in this case, we have steel as our example. So steel is mostly composed of iron. That's why I classified iron as a solvent. And when it's combined with solute, the carbon is a solute, uh, that's one way that steel is made. Lastly, we have gas and solid. So hydrogen, it's possible for hydrogen to be adsorbed by metals such as platinum. So in that case, when, when that happens, hydrogen um, is the solute and platinum would be the solid solvent. I just want to clarify that adsorbed, to be adsorbed is different from being absorbed. Adsorbed means that hydrogen, in this case, is adhering to the surface of platinum instead of being absorbed, which would mean that it's passing through the surface. So there's a difference between those terms. Next, let's remind ourselves what it means to be soluble versus insoluble. So solubility describes a substance, the solute, that can be dissolved in a given solvent. So there's different degrees of solubility in addition to just simply being soluble. If we're talking about ionic compounds, there are a set of rules that we can follow or list. So here they are. Uh, notice that um, there's multiple rules here. We're just going to pick two of them and look at some examples. So we'll start with the substance copper 2 nitrate. So copper 2 nitrate, according to rule number one, nitrate salts are soluble, should be soluble in water. So this is a picture of copper 2 nitrate dissolved in some water. You can see that this is a picture of a solution because it is clear. It is, you can see through it. There is a glass stirring rod inserted in the speaker and it's clearly visible. Okay, so all uh, nitrate salts are soluble. Insoluble means that the substance will not dissolve in a solvent. So given the example of lead to iodide, let's take a look at the rules. Notice in rule three, it says here most iodide salts are soluble with the exceptions of silver, lead, and mercury. So it seems here we have one of the exceptions. And notice in the picture, when you are mixing uh, two liquids together, so the, the, they're both clear colorless liquids. Upon being mixed together, this yellow precipitate forms. This yellow solid or this yellow precipitate forming is evidence that lead to iodide is insoluble in water. So upon seeing the collection of this precipitate, we can tell that lead to iodide is insoluble. Another term to consider is miscibility. Miscibility is similar to solubility, but instead it's used to describe the mixing of liquids and gases. So to be miscible when liquids or gases is when liquids or gases can mix evenly. So our first example involves chlorine gas and air. So Air is a mixture, a homogeneous mixture of many, many gases, and we're simply adding 
poisonous chlorine gas here to this mix. So this greenish cloud represents the chlorine and you'll notice the outer edges are lighter because the gas is diffusing into the air. So it's mixing into the air. So gases as solutes in gases as solvents are always miscible. Another example we can consider is a liquid-liquid mixture of isopropyl alcohol and water. I've zoomed in for you a little bit so you can see the pictures carefully. The first container has isopropyl rubbing alcohol in a concentration of 50%. That means that half of the contents of this container are made up of the isopropyl alcohol and the other half of the mixture is water. In the container on the right side, you can see that the concentration is a little bit higher of the isopropyl alcohol, it's at 70%. So the isopropyl alcohol is greater in concentration in the second container. However, looking at the two bottles without the labels, you wouldn't know the difference between those mixtures because they are evenly mixed, they're evenly distributed, and they're both uh, isopropyl alcohol and water are clear colorless liquids. So the color wouldn't give it away either. These two bottles contain the same mixtures but in different proportions, and that's okay for a mixture. So both of these are examples of miscible substances. Let's look at something that is immiscible. So immiscible means when a liquid solid will not dissolve in a liquid solvent. So a common example um, is water and oil. We know that they do not mix. Oil, oil, the particles in oil, the molecules that make up oil are less dense than the water, so it will float to the top when poured into a glass of water. Let's see if we can use these diagrams to depict the phrases that we looked at earlier. So in the first picture, we have uh, a white rectangle. It looks the same top to bottom. It looks the same left to right. So the appearance of it is completely uniform. If this was a depiction of a solution, I would say that the solute is completely soluble in this solution. In the next picture, you'll notice that the particles have settled to the bottom. So some of the, sol the solute that was added to this solution has settled to the bottom. So I would say that in this case, the solute is insoluble. In the final picture, you can see that there's two different layers. And this could be a great example of two liquids that are immiscible. So other than the solubility rules, what are some factors to consider to help us understand if something will dissolve, if a solute will dissolve in a given solvent? There are three factors to consider that will affect the solubility of a solute in a given solvent. So the first one we'll look at is the polarity of the solute and the solvent. This diagram helps us review what polarity means. So a common molecule we'd often evaluate for, for polarity is water. Remember, oxygen and hydrogen exist in a covalent bond in this molecule. Covalent means sharing of electrons. But because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, it exerts a stronger pull on the electrons within that bond. For that reason, the electrons spend more time around the oxygen, giving the oxygen a partial negative charge. The hydrogens, as a result, ha end up with a partial positive charge. Electrons involved in the bond do not spend as much time around the hydrogens. In addition to polarity of the solute and the solvent, we're also going to look at temperature and pressure and talk about how they affect solubility. So starting with polarity, remember oil is a nonpolar molecule. In this picture here, oil is 
in the top half of the diagram, it's got these long carbon fatty acid chains. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see them better. So notice the saturation of the hydrogens, this long alkane, this is the symmetry of this part of the molecule renders them as nonpolar. Okay, then um, if you scroll up a little bit, you'll notice that the top part of this molecule, the glycerol part, has um, oxygens on the end here, giving it a slight polar nature. And so what will happen when encountering water is the molecule will align itself so that the hydrophobic parts of it are as far away from the water as possible. Okay, so remember oil and water for, form those very distinct layers. Okay, now you might also recall studying the phospholipid bilayer in a cell membrane in your biology class. Remember the phospholipid has a polar phosphate head followed by um, long nonpolar fatty acid tails attached to it. So the tails rep resemble the structure of the fatty acid chain on this vegetable oil molecule. The phosphate heads, which are hydrophilic, water loving, will align themselves so that they are facing the outer part of the cell and the interior part of the cell. Both are watery environments and the hydrophobic tails, the nonpolar tails, will arrange themselves so they face the interior of the cell membrane so they can be away from the watery environment. Notice how the polar parts of the molecules orient themselves to face the water molecules. This should indicate to us that the stronger the attractions between the solvent and solute molecules, the intermolecular attractions, the greater the solubility of that solvent. Now let's take a look at some combinations of solute and solvent regarding their polarity. So our first example is when we have both a polar solute and a polar solvent, methanol in water. Notice methanol has a hydroxyl group attached to it. The hydroxyl group means that this molecule is capable of hydrogen bonding, as is water. So the fact that they both have this connection will allow methanol to dissolve in the water. In the next two examples, we have a nonpolar polar combination. So with oil and water, we already know that they will not mix, they will not dissolve. And with water and gasoline, so gasoline uh, being is nonpolar because gasoline is primarily made up of long chain alkanes such as octane. If you recall, octane is a hydrocarbon made up of eight carbons that are saturated with hydrogen. So that molecule is very symmetric and as a result is nonpolar. Mixing these two would not be successful. The water would not dissolve in the gasoline. Finally, we have oil and gasoline. Both are nonpolar substances and they will dissolve in each other. So the oil will dissolve in the gasoline. So it's safe to say, based on these examples, that polar substances will dissolve other polar substances and nonpolar substances will dissolve other nonpolar substances. So the phrase that is often heard or encountered is like dissolves like. This indicates that we're talking about polarity and um, when the solute and solvent have similar polarities, the, they, are, they tend to mix easily. Now let's take a look at temperature and its impact on solubility. First, we're gonna look at solid solutes. So this is an example of a solubility curve. 
the solubility curve shows how the solubility of a solute can change as the temperature of the solution changes. So on this graph, on the x-axis, we have temperature in degrees Celsius. And note that we go from 0 degrees all the way to 100 degrees. And on the y-axis, we have the grams of solute that we're adding per 100 grams of water. So you can add anywhere on this graph up from 0 grams all the way up to 150 grams of any of these solutes. Notice that most of these solutes listed are ionic compounds. Notice that the general trend of these lines or these curves is upward. Most of them have a positive slope. This indicates that the higher the temperature, the more you increase the temperature, the greater the solubility of the solid solutes. An exception though is cerium sulfate. It tends to decrease in solubility as the temperature increases, so that's um, an unusual characteristic. And another substance on here with a negative slope is ammonia. Ammonia between the ranges of 0 and 100 degrees is actually a gas at these temperatures. And notice that it has a negative slope. So the solubility of gases in general actually declines. For solids, though, most of them increase in solubility as the temperature increases. Here's some more gases for us to examine. So we have methane gas, oxygen, carbon monoxide, and helium. And notice here, as the temperature increases, this time the solubility actually goes down. Okay, so it has the opposite effect. Increasing the temperature of gases will actually decrease their solubility. Okay, think about it. Gases have a high kinetic energy. Their molecules are moving very fast. If you were to add more heat and thereby increase their kinetic energy, they are very highly unlikely to go back into solution. Now let's take a look at pressure. So with pressure, an increase in partial pressure of the gas above the solvent increases the solubility of gaseous solutes. So let's take a look at this picture here. Under normal conditions, you can see that the rate at which the gas, the solute, which are these red dots here, enters the solution equals the rate at which those molecules escape the solution to enter the gaseous phase. When pressure is increased, as shown in the picture on the right here, with this weight, more gas is dissolved. So the reason for that is due to the added pressure, the rate at which the gas molecules are striking the liquid surface and entering the solution phase increases. In this graph, instead of having temperature on the x-axis, we have partial pressure. Uh, in atmospheres. So as the outside pressure of the system increases, pressure on the system is increasing, the solubility of these gases is also increasing. So you can see helium, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and oxygen, they're all increasing. They all have a positive slope as the pressure is increased. Now gases are compressible. That's why changing pressure, increasing the pressure, will have an increased effect on their solubility. Liquids and solids are not compressible the way that gases are, so a change in pressure will not have any effect on their solubility. Now we're going to talk about the process of solvation. So solvation is simply the attractive interaction of the solvent molecules with the solute. And a lot of this has to do with intermolecular forces. So if we consider this picture of a solvent being added to this beaker, and also the solute, the yellow substance in the spoon, being added to this beaker, what will initially happen is that the yellow solute, let's say it's an ionic compound, 
and at a larger in a, at a larger scale looks like what's in this smaller box here at the bottom. So the ionic formula units of this solute are pictured down here. What initially happens is that the water molecules will surround the solute. If the intermolecular forces between the water molecules and the individual ions are strong enough to overcome the forces between the ions involved in the ionic bond, then this solute will be soluble in this solvent. And you will end up with a solution like the one in this picture here, where the solute and solvent are evenly dispersed. When the solvent happens to be water, we call the process of solvation hydration. So that's when the polar water molecules surround the dissociated ions dissolving the solute. So here, if we say that that substance being added to the water is sodium chloride, for example, the water molecules will isolate each of the ions in this way, where the uh, delta negative end of the water molecules will face the positively charged sodium ion and pull it away from the chloride ion. So the chloride ion will also be surrounded in a similar fashion, but notice here in this view that instead of the oxygens facing the ion, the hydrogen ends, the positive, delta positive ends face the negatively charged ion. So there are four factors that actually affect the rate of solvation. And they are particle size, stirring, temperature, and the amount of solute already dissolved. So the question we were going to ask ourselves with that fourth factor is, is the solution saturated, unsaturated, or supersaturated? And we'll look at what each of those terms mean. So let's look at particle size first. The larger the particle, the longer it will take to dissolve. So consider this picture with this tablet uh, as a whole versus um, broken in half, broken in quarters, and then crushed. Okay, which of these do you think will dissolve the fastest when placed in water? Hopefully you picked the powder. The smaller the particle size means that there's more surface area exposed, allowing for more collisions between the solute and the solvent. So smaller particle size will allow for an increase in the solvation rate. Let's take a look at temperature. When temperature is raised, the kinetic energy of the molecules will also increase and that will encourage more collisions between the solute and the solvent. When that happens, there will be more contact between the solute and solvent, and that will allow for the solvation rate to increase. Finally, let's take a look at mixing. So mixing is simply when you stir the, the, the liquid. Stirring or causing more agitation between the solute and solvent particles will, again, allow for more frequent collisions. So whether you use a stirring rod or a magnetic stirrer, as shown in this picture here, um, the, man the magnet will be, would be placed in the beaker, and then the beaker would be placed on a surface that resembles a hot plate but is, in fact, a magnetic stirrer. And once the, it, the magnet in the magnetic stirrer is activated, it will in turn activate the stir in the beaker and cause some agitation, allowing for um, more contact, more collisions between the solute and solvent, causing the solvation rate to increase. Let's take a look at saturation. So in the first beaker on the left, we have an unsaturated solution. So what that means is that this solution contains less dissolved solute for a given temperature and pressure. More solute can be added for dissolving. So you can see at, in the molecular view here that the 
atoms involved, the particles involved in making up the solute are entering into solution at a greater rate than the particles coming back out of solution. In the next picture, you'll notice uh, we have a solution that contains the maximum amount of dissolved solute. So when that happens, we call that saturated solution. So notice the arrows in this picture. They show the, uh, the particles from the solute entering into the solution. Well, the, air, the particles entering solution are actually equal to the particles coming out of the solution. So with this particular picture, as more solute is added, the slower the solute will dissolve. When the point of saturation is reached, the solution is said to be in equilibrium with the undissolved solute. So if more solute is added, it will not dissolve. So when is a solution supersaturated? Well, supersaturation occurs when you have a solution that contains more dissolved solute than a saturated solution at the same temperature. And there's a way for you to achieve a supersaturated solution. So the steps involved are that first you need to filter off the excess solute. So once you have a saturated solution, you might notice that there's some residue collecting. That's how you know that you can't add any more solute to it. So filter that off. Once that's filtered off, decrease the temperature. As soon as you decrease the temperature, you can add what we call a seed crystal. So a seed crystal is just a simple, small crystal of solute, which provides a template for the crystallization of excess solute. Once that seed crystal is added, solute particles will then rapidly begin to leave the solution and form a crystalline precipitate. So you'll notice in the final picture, the solute particles are leaving the solution and precipitating. And then you can see they're collecting around the original seed crystal here. Now we're going to look more closely at the solubility curve and make sure we understand how to interpret it. So a solubility curve shows the amount of solute that will dissolve in 100 grams of water at a given temperature. So here we're looking at uh, particularly potassium nitrate. So it's showing that using this line, we can see just how much solute, how much potassium nitrate we can add to 100 grams of water and continue to dissolve it as we heat it up. So if you are below this line, then your solution will be what we call unsaturated. If you are on the line, you will have a saturated solution. So for example, if at 30 degrees, you were to add 50 grams of potassium nitrate to 100 grams of water, you would have a saturated solution. Above the line, above this line of saturation, you would have what we call a supersaturated solution. So now let's take a look at some examples. At 50 degrees, 30 grams of potassium nitrate is added to 100 grams of water. Okay, is this solution saturated, unsaturated, or supersaturated? So let's take this pen here. and look for the 50 degrees, okay? And we're looking for 30 grams. So that point is right here. So at this point, we are unsaturated, okay? So just keep that in mind. Now let's take a look at the next question, part B. How many more grams of potassium nitrate can be added to 100 grams of water to make the solution saturated? So 
because we know this question is related to the previous question, we know that we already have 30 grams in solution. So to make the solution saturated, let's figure out how much more we'll need. Well, at 50 degrees, which is up here, it will take 90 grams of potassium nitrate to make this solution saturated. So if we already have 30 grams in solution, but we need 90, how many more grams do we need to add? So hopefully you're able to understand that we need to subtract 90 minus 30 grams and that 60 grams is what needs to be added to make the solution saturated. The next question is part C. If the saturated solution were cooled from 50 degrees to 25 degrees Celsius, how many grams of potassium nitrate would precipitate out of the solution? So at 25 degrees, we are right here on the graph. And if we go up to the solubility curve for potassium nitrate, you can see that it will take 40 grams for uh, of solute to make that solution saturated. So if we cool our existing solution from 50 degrees all the way down to 25 degrees, how much potassium nitrate will precipitate out? So the way to approach that problem would be to subtract 40 grams, which is what we have here, 40 grams, uh, from 90 grams, the original amount. And that would give us 50 grams of potassium nitrate that would precipitate. Let's look at two more examples. So this solubility curve diagram has several solutes to examine. We're just going to look at two examples though. The first one is how many grams of potassium chlorate can be dissolved in 300 grams of water at 70 degrees Celsius? So notice it says 300 grams, where in the diagram here, the y-axis shows that we're actually only limited to 100 grams of water. So the water amount has been tripled. So since the water amount has been tripled, what do you think we can do to the solute amount? We should be able to triple that as well. So let's start by looking for potassium chlorate and identifying where it is in this diagram and then looking for the 70 degree mark. So potassium chlorate, hopefully you were able to identify it, is this brown line right here. Just circle that for you. And we're looking for 70 degrees. So we're going to mark 70 degrees is right over here, this blue dot right here. Now at 70 degrees, 30 grams 30 grams, it's not the best straight line, but you get the idea. 30 grams of potassium chlorate will, in 100 grams of water, will make the solution saturated. So hopefully you can see that all we have to do is multiply 30 grams by three, triple the amount of solute because the amount of water has been tripled, and that will result in 90 grams of potassium chlorate that can be added. Let's take a look at number two. If 50 grams of water saturated with potassium dichromate, Cr2O7 is dichromate, at 62 degrees is slow, slowly evaporated to dryness, how many grams of the dry salt will be recovered? Let's look for potassium dichromate on the graph. So I'm gonna circle potassium dichromate for you. Next, we're gonna look for 62 degrees Celsius. So 62 degrees, I'd say it's probably right about here and go up to the purple line that represents the curve for potassium dichromate. And I would say that that is right about there, this point here, okay? Take it over to the y-axis and you can see that 40 grams of this solute 
dissolved in 100 grams of water will make this a saturated solution. So note in the question that we're not given 100 grams, we're given 50 grams, so half the amount of water present. So if we are dividing the amount of water in half, guess what we can do with the solute? Hopefully you guessed we can divide the solute in half as well. So 40 grams divided by two is 20 grams of potassium dichromate that can be recovered. You should now be able to interpret a solubility graph and answer the questions related to solutions.